Hi everybody. I am incredibly delighted to be able to be back this week. I wish we didn't have to miss last Sunday, but to be able to really put in the study and then be able to do the whole um, Tea with Jesus recording was a little more than I was really able to handle at that time. But I seem to be getting better every day and I want to definitely get back to it and make sure that I have Tea with Jesus out this Sunday. I'm really thankful for all the ways that I have seen God's strength and His faithfulness and His love um, in these last weeks. And I am um, looking forward now for us to continue on now into Luke. And um, I actually went back and listened to my last Tea with Jesus to get myself reconnected and make sure I was kind of flowing along here. So we're going to start this week in Luke 1. But this time we'll be starting with verse 57. The last thing that we knew in Luke was that um, Mary had gone to see her kinswoman, Elizabeth, who was carrying John, who became the forerunner for the Lord, John the Baptist, and he paved the way for the Lord when he came, for Jesus. And um, the two women had a wonderful visit, and I think it meant a lot to both of them. And then um, Mary, I think probably shortly after John's birth, had gone back home again. So the very last verse um, in that section of Luke was that Mary had stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So by this point, Mary now is around um, six months expecting with um, Jesus. So um, when I see, no, Elizabeth would have been six months when Mary got there. So Mary had just, the baby had just been conceived. So Mary's probably about three months along. Right at that. <laughs> okay. I am going to go ahead now and read Luke 1, 57, actually through 80. That will be the end of Luke 1, verses 57 through 80. This is in my uh, New International Version, my NIV Study Bible. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And in verse 80 it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. So now we have John's birth 
and he was a miracle to start with. He was absolutely a miracle. And um, they were well past childbearing years, and Gabriel had come to Zechariah and told him, you will have this child. And Zechariah was just very, very like skeptical and very unbelieving at that moment. And so from then on, he was not able to speak until, as we can see, until he declared after John's birth that his name would be John. So this child now, who ended up being a kinsman of Jesus, um, was to grow up to prepare the way for Jesus. He was the, the prophetic fulfillment, the fulfillment of the prophecy that um, before the Messiah came, uh, Elijah would rise and be proclaiming his, the way of the Lord. And that was just used like symbolic, symbolically um, that uh, John would be mighty in spirit and would be preparing people to know that the very Messiah they waited for was, was come, that he had come, and he was on his way into their lives. And that's it, what an amazing thing, and that God worked within this family for this. I think it's wonderful. So, um, as we have said um, before, if you listen to the previous, like Tea with Jesus, it was really considered a reproach from God, actually, within their culture for women not to have any children. And it was certainly looking like Elizabeth never would. And so she was just so joyful to have this baby. And her neighbors and relatives really had heard that God had shown her great mercy. They felt like God had shown her her mercy by this child. And so they shared her joy. And then it was the culture, the common culture at the time then, that when he was eight days old, they would um, circumcise him. He was a, a born into a Jewish family, and he was to be circumcised. It's interesting because um, in a newborn, the vitamin K levels are at a really good rate in the body. Vitamin K has a lot to do with the blood's ability to clot, which I've definitely learned. And um, so uh, it's a, eight days is an ideal time to circumcise a child when their blood clotting capability and the vitamin K is really at a good point. It's just one of the ways that God knows what he's doing, and I think it's neat. So, um, you know, during this time then, they were going to name him, and it was customary to name a child after a father or, you know, after somebody in the family. And so they were going to name him Zachariah, and then, um, you know, Elizabeth spoke up. No, you know, she knew, um, I'm sure that, you know, obviously... Uh, Zachariah can write, and I'm sure he had really told Elizabeth everything that had happened when Gabriel came to him. And so she knew the baby's name was to be John. And um, they said to her, well, there's nobody in your relatives who has that name. That, this just isn't what you should do. And so they turned to Zachariah, and I guess they assumed that since he couldn't speak, he couldn't hear, um, because they just made signs to him. And, of course, he could hear just fine. But um, anyway, made signs to him, um, you know, finding out, you know, as the child's father, what would you like him to be named? And he picked up a tablet, which probably at that time was a wooden board that had been covered with wax. And they would use a, a sharpened piece of wood called a stylus, and they would write, you know, in the, the Hebrew characters on, the, on this um, wax. And so he wrote on it, of course he was a priest and a very educated man, and he, he asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote on that tablet, his name is John, and held it up for everybody to see. Well, as soon as he proclaimed that, um, the Lord released his speech, and he was able to start talking again. And, oh my goodness, what's the first thing he did? He began to praise God. He and Elizabeth had no doubt what, whatsoever this was God at work in their life with this child. And also, John had been with Mary, and John knew very well that Mary was carrying the Messiah. And he's just rejoicing. And the neighbors, everybody was filled with awe. And all throughout this area in the hill country in Judea, everybody was talking about it. And because, obviously, there had been something supernatural of God in all of this, they were wondering, you know, what is it about this child? Why is he special? Who is he going to be? And then Zechariah... Um, just was filled with the Holy Spirit so strongly, and he began to prophesy. And um, a prophecy can predict things, but it also proclaims God, God's Word. And um, the Holy Spirit was helping 
him as he had Elizabeth earlier to just know something and to be, have something revealed to them by God himself so that they could speak truth out that they would just not have known otherwise. The, the second that, that um, Elizabeth heard Mary's voice and the baby just leaped in her womb, she knew she was in the presence of the Messiah. And so Zechariah began to come out with this wonderful prophetic, um, you know, some call it a song, he may have spoken it, I like to think he sang it, they often call it Zechariah's song, and um, he began to really praise God and listen to how much of the truth of the coming Messiah that is in this. Um, he knows his son would proclaim the way, and yet Zechariah here is mainly talking about God bringing salvation through the coming Messiah. Now, when we listen to this, let's not think about redeeming God's people and protecting them as just national security, um, them being protected from the Romans or things like that. Let's listen to these words because the strongest thing in here is that the people could receive salvation morally, spiritually, that God was bringing salvation to people. His father, this is verse 67, and this will go through now into verse 79, his father, John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he's come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. The horn is often used to represent strength, and it's, it's a horn of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David, and, you know, they were all from the family of David. That's why... Um, when the census was taken, they had to go to Bethlehem because that was the city of David. So they were all, you know, um, had been descended down from the house of David. And, you know, in, in Zechariah's talking that the, all of this was, was spoken by the holy prophets long ago. And he's proclaiming this. God's bringing about the promises that he's made to us hundreds and literally thousands of years ago that they have remembered and kept records of and have in their scrolls that God had brought a promise of a Messiah. And you have to remember that there's a good evidence that in the, about 400 years between when Malachi, um, you know, the time of Malachi, that, that last minor prophet in the Old Testament, in the beginning where we see the birth of Christ coming, um, there's at least a 400 year period. And during that time, there had evidently not been prophets really raising up, speaking from the Lord, speaking for him. And so, um, they still believed in the coming Messiah, but it had been a time of of just not hearing a lot about it in a long time, but they never forgot. And of course, now they're under a very oppressive Roman regime here. Um, so he goes on in verse 71 to say, Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. And you know, this covenant... Of, of you know being with God's people, the the oath he swore to his father Abraham, um, to you know to our father Abraham, you know um, Zechariah is saying here, th this oath that God made with Abraham to raise up a mighty nation, and it would be countless, it would be as many as the sands of the sea. Well, you know ultimately throughout history that's not just going to be the Jewish people, because through the coming of the Messiah, through Christ's coming, and His death and resurrection, salvation would come to all men who would be willing to accept him, to receive what he'd done for them. So it became bigger even than the nation of Israel, this promise that God had given Abraham. So, you know, that promise was to rescue them from enemies, to enable us to serve him. Oh, wow, to enable us to serve God without fear. Oh, this was the promise God had given that, that, that the nation of Israel through Christ, if they would receive his salvation, and, and for us, if we'll receive his salvation, that we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before God all our days. What a wonderful promise. Go back into the Word and read this in Luke 1, at the end of Luke 1. What wonderful promises these are. And you know, this, this covenant actually begins earlier than Abraham. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden all the way back to the beginning. I want us to take a moment and look at that. 
Let's go to Genesis. And we're going to go now into chapter 3 of Genesis. And, you know, God had given um, Adam and Eve a beautiful place to live. Um, called the Garden of Eden. Um, wonderful food there. Um, at this point, um, nothing, not even just no body, but nothing ate meat. At this point, their, their animals didn't even eat meat. And um, people did not. And it was just full of just wonderful, good, healthy food to eat um, that just grew in this garden. And um, because God wanted man's obedience to be something that he would choose because he loved God and because he wanted to serve him and obey him. And then God did allow there to be a choice for them to make. He only asked one thing of them. Do not eat the fruit that's from the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. Because if you do, then in that day you will die. And so don't eat from there. And so it was not a difficult thing. They had plenty, plenty, plenty of other things. But there's someone else that enters into this picture. And we have to understand he's an enemy. And we have to understand that he hates God. And now he is hating God's creation. So let's see what happened here and how this becomes part of the prophecy that even Zechariah is talking about. Covenants of old that God has promised so that we can serve God without fear and be in his presence with joy. I am going to take a second and really read, um, I think, probably, um, I was going to do the whole thing, but... Uh, yeah, I'll I'll go. Yeah, I'll tell you when I'm going to stop because I may want to go a little farther than I thought. But now the serpent, which is is Satan. This is beginning of chapter three. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, "Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden?" Now you see how quickly he's putting a spin and a twist on God's word. Did God say he couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Of course not. That's absurd. They were asked to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, God didn't say they mustn't touch it. He said don't eat of the fruit of this tree. She's already kind of adding things to what God said and getting herself a little bit confused here. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So it boils down to the same thing Satan still says to people. Are you sure that God knows what he's talking about? And aren't you smart enough to be able to figure things out yourself? Why, why are you so dependent on God? Why can't you have knowledge? Why can't you be able to know what God knows? Why should we trust God? We'd be okay without him. That's the kind of stuff Satan still speaks into people's lives. Well, in verse 6, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, all of a sudden she says, Well, I can know about good and evil. She didn't even know what evil was. But she'd already been deceived into just not trusting God and thinking, well, he may think I don't, I shouldn't have this, but I think I should. I should have this wisdom. So, noticing it was desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Sometimes I think we think that Eve was all by herself and, um, you know, ate of the fruit and then Adam was like, oh my goodness, and then, you know, he, she talked him into eating it. I, from what the scripture says, I think that he was there with her. She's the first one that grabbed the fruit, but he was there and he ate it also. Well, in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They weren't learning 
to suddenly be modest. They had not had any fear at all of being unclothed in the garden. What they'd learned, what they discovered, was shame, which is unfortunately what the enemy loves to heap on us. God, by the way, doesn't heap shame on us. He may give us honest, true guilt. He may heap conviction on us. We may need chastisement, but he does not heap on us shame. He wants us to be forgiven and reconciled to him. Satan wants us to think that we are the sin that we've committed. God knows that we are his precious child and we have sinned and must repent, but we are not the sin. And that's a, a shame that Satan loves to heap on people. Well, apparently Adam and Eve had been used to hanging out with God, like in the cool of the evening in the garden. I mean, they were, they were just literally able to be with him. Oh my goodness, I they, had, they had no clue what they were getting ready to lose here. They had no clue what it cost what it cost the whole world. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He must, I mean, they heard the sound. He was in some sort of a form, maybe, I, I don't know exactly. I know angels appear to us and there's times in the scripture where Jesus has appeared even in the Old Testament. So in some bodily form, God was there because he was walking in the garden. God the Father, God the Son, it was God. He was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. His sin made him exposed. And he said, Who told you you were naked? God's like, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, obviously, God knew this had happened, but he needed Adam and Eve to be willing to really talk about it and admit it. So this is what Adam said. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. God, you gave me this woman and she gave it to me. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And of course, the serpent did deceive her and lied to her, but she still made the choice to disobey God. So the Lord God said to the serpent, now, here we go. This is, this was, was absolutely fulfilled through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, he's, he's not talking to the animal here. He's talking to, the, to Satan, who at that time probably didn't look as much like a snake. He must have had arms and legs because he's now going to have to crawl on his belly. He says, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Now this offspring of the woman is referring directly to Jesus. Listen to what God said was going to happen to Satan. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. You will wound him, but he will crush your head. And then he goes on to talk, you know, I think that's as far as I'll go. Um, that is through verse 16, uh, through verse 15. So that is Genesis 3, 1 through 15. God goes on to talk about the consequences to Adam and Eve. And of course, they could no longer be in the Garden of Eden. And God guarded the way so they could not return. Um, and it'd be good to go and read that. But the point I wanted to get to here is that when, this, when sin entered the world, when this happened, and all of a sudden Satan is just, he was laughing because he caused God's creation to fall. And apparently after this, um, you know, um, animals did start being, being animals started dying. It, it, everything kind of started changing. I think it caused terrible damage to all sorts of things. But um, also it, it's important to understand that God made garments for them to cover their shame. And it was by shedding the blood of animals and making um, skin garments, fur garments. Not because God's mean to animals. That's not the point at all. God made them and he cares about them. But he is beginning to really show that in order to cover the sin, in order to cover and, and cover their, their nakedness, it was going to require the shedding of blood. And we go on then later on into just the sacrifice of animals for the remission of sins. Um, and that was always only temporary. But then finally the sacrifice of Jesus for the final forgiveness for all sin, for all mankind, if they just will receive it. 
So this covenant that's back here in Genesis is just saying to this suddenly fallen world, one day a child born of a woman is going to crush the head of Satan. He's going to bring victory. The Bible calls Jesus the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God knew that if he was going to give us free will and a free choice, that man would choose to not believe him at many, many, many times and in many ways break his heart. But he knew from the beginning that he would send the salvation that we need. Jesus knew he would come. And so this was going to happen clear from the foundation of the world that one day God would provide a way because he loves us and he did not want us to be lost forever. So now as we go back to Luke 1 and um, I love in verses 74 and 75 um, God is remembering his covenant and he's rescuing us and that's for the nation of Israel and for all of us who are Gentiles to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. What a wonderful promise. And I'll tell you what, ultimately it's, the, it's Satan, that, that serpent in the garden, who's Jesus defeated. Ultimately it's him who is our enemy and that God will and does protect us from him. Even if things happen in our life, he will never get a hold of us. We are eternally secure in the Lord. So now we'll just finish here. Um, he now is really speaking more directly to John and telling him, you're going to be called a prophet, my child, a prophet of the Most High. You'll go before the Lord to prepare the way. And, it, and to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. John paved the way for people to understand that they needed to repent, that they had sins that needed to be forgiven, but that they could be forgiven. And because of the tender mercy of our God, and by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. Oh my goodness, that in here it's the sun, like the sun in the sky, but it, this, this rising sun, the morning star, is Jesus. The rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. What a wonderful prophecy and what a wonderful thing that John would be proclaiming as he paved the way for Jesus. Now, um, John was born to very old parents. We don't know how old, but old enough that it was a miracle that they even had him. So I think there's a really good chance that he probably lost his parents very young. And um, when it says desert, um, it's not necessarily a place without water and all that kind of stuff. A lot of times it could even just mean a very deserted um, area. And um, so it wasn't like he was just, you know, living out on the sand. But um, the, there's desert in Judea. It lies between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. And it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, empty. I mean, he survived there. But probably as a fairly young man, he went out there. And that's where he was living. And he didn't really appear back publicly until he was about 30, um, about the same time, of course, that Jesus began to appear publicly. So here we have, you know, John coming into the world to prepare the way and this wonderful prophecy of what the coming of the Lord was going to bring that God gave to Zechariah. So these two people have just been, Zechariah and Elizabeth both, have just been so filled with God's presence in the Holy Spirit. And their son was filled from the day he was, I mean, from, from the womb. I'm not sure exactly when it was, but from before he was ever born, he was filled with the Spirit. So he grew strong and strong in spirit, and was, was growing up to pave the way for Jesus when he made his public appearance. So we're going to be starting into chapter 2 next week, and I just think this is um, it's just wonderful to be able to dig in and really look at what's going on here. And I want us to remember that this salvation is something that God cared about from the very beginning, and I'm grateful for that. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for how faithful you are. And God, I just pray that we will see your goodness around us all the time. That we will look so that we will notice and have a thankful heart. Lord, 
for people whose circumstances seem harder than they think they could ever handle, then you carry the burden, Lord. You are strong in our weakness. Please bring healing. I am trusting you in my life, Lord. And for all those out there, so many people comment on different things that they are struggling with physically. God, please just touch their bodies. Give them strength. Walk with them. Give them courage and peace and hope and joy, even in the midst of a rough time. I know that you can heal. I praise you for that. And Lord, just restore love in families where it has gone so cold. And I just pray, Lord, that we have this powerful thing called forgiveness walked out in our life through your strength and your help. So, Lord, thank you that you came. Jesus, thank you that you came. And I just pray we can begin to even grasp the impact of what that means in our life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am very, very glad that no matter what circumstances that we have in our life, God is faithful. No matter what's going on, let, give yourself a chance to notice His love and strength. I tell you, there's been days in my life where just being there the next day and keeping going was due to the very presence of God and was kind of its own miracle. So I'm going to end this with a little shot outside that I, I filmed because every day that those flowers on my dog would get brighter and they're sticking around even though sometimes we'll have bad weather it's just they stick around and they're beautiful and I don't want to ever forget that God is gracious to show me his goodness and um, that no matter what happens we are so better off with him than we ever would be if we didn't have him in our life no matter what happens in our life God remains good Things don't always turn out the way that we thought they would, but ultimately His will is the best thing and it always reflects His love and His goodness. Just like these beautiful flowers all over my tree here that bring me such joy. I will see you next week. I'm tremendously glad to be back. Thank you for your prayers, your comments, and your love. And when I say I pray for you, I do. So I'm going to say goodbye and I will see you next week.